Now a hearing on the Y2K computer problem and transportation. Two House subcommittees heard officials discuss the computer readiness of the nation's transportation communication systems as the millennium year approaches. Testifying at the 90-minute hearing, Deputy Transportation Secretary Mortimer Downey and FAA Administrator Jane Garvey. Okay, roads are Switch. Can just reverse? Okay. The uh, joint hearing of the House Subcommittee on Government Management, Information and Technology and the Subcommittee on Technology of the House Science Committee uh, will come to order. Each year, more than 500 million passengers board a pair of planes. Most of them are secure in the knowledge that they will reach their destination safely and reasonably on time. They depend on the intricate computers that keep the network of communications and mechanical systems running whether the year is 1999 or 2000. But that's only one part of the nation's vital transportation infrastructure. The railroads are an equally integral part of the travel and commerce that support everyday life in America. Each year, thousands of lumbering freight trains move across the nation's network of rail lines carrying millions of tons in goods and raw materials. These are the items that keep our store shelves filled and our factories open. The railroads remain one of the most vital links to the continued prosperity of the United States. The Port of Long Beach, which is in my district, as is the Port of Los Angeles, is the busiest container port in the United States. Los Angeles is the second busiest in the United States, and together they're the sixth busiest in the world, and maybe even the third. In 1997, nearly 60 million metric tons of cargo moved through the port, everything from petroleum, iron, and steel to electronics, toys, and motor vehicles. Fifty percent of those imports are moved by train to cities in the Midwest and East. We must make sure that neither of these transportation networks falls victim to the year 2000 problem. The challenge often called the Millennium Bug, or simply Y2K, dates back to the 1960s and 70s when we realized there was very little capacity in most of the huge mainframe computers. And somebody had the bright idea, instead of saying, gee, in 1967, why don't we knock the 19 off of it and just say 67? Now, they knew when the year 2000 occurred that it would be 00, zero and there wouldn't be a 20 there. And that's the problem. The year 1967, for example, appears as 67, and the first two digits are assumed to be 19. Unless corrected, these date-sensitive computer systems and microchips embedded in countless mechanical devices may misinterpret the two zeros in 2000 as 1900. The fear is that the confusion may cause the systems to generate erroneous information, corrupt other systems, or possibly shut down. In February, the Department of Transportation, which is responsible for overseeing the nation's air and rail lines, as well as federal highways and waterways, reported that only 53 percent of its mission-critical computer systems are year 2000 compliant. At the same time, the Federal Aviation Administration, which oversees air safety and operates the nation's vital air traffic control system, reported that only 60 percent of its mission-critical systems were ready for January 1st, 2000. The FAA has said it cannot meet President Clinton's March 31st deadline to be 100 percent compliant. But will the agency be able to meet its own self-imposed deadline of June 30th, 1999? To its credit, the FAA has historically maintained one of the finest safety records in the world. And we have no doubt that everyone at this agency is working extremely hard to retain that highly regarded status. We're here today to learn how the enormous year 2000 challenge is being met in the air, on the ground, and on the nation's waterways. So I welcome the witnesses very much. We have the good part of the leadership of the uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, and uh, with the Deputy Secretary, Mortimer Downey, uh, the Administrator of Federal Aviation, Jane Garvey. And we will start, however, with our usual first witness, which is the representative of the General Accounting Office, which is the Congress's programmatic and fiscal auditor. And uh, we try to send them into every agency and head off every uh, hearing we hold. 
And so we welcome also Mr. Joel Wilmanson, Director, Civil Agencies Information System, General Accounting Office, part of the legislative branch, and Mr. Kenneth M. Mead, the Inspector General, Department of Transportation. Now, as you all know, we swear in all witnesses before this subcommittee, and I would ask you if some of your assistants are going to uh, contribute to the dialogue. I just as soon swear everybody in now. That's what I did with the Defense Department a few weeks ago on another subject, and then that saves me giving oaths throughout the testimony. So if all will stand up who are going to be doing some talking or loud-voiced advising, please raise your hand or your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee? And uh, is the truth the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Note that there will be uh, roughly 10 or 11 that affirm that oath. And so we will begin with Mr. Wilmerson. Uh, yes, sure. I didn't see you come in. I'm so small, Mr. The distinguished, the distinguished, uh, the distinguished co chairman of the working group task force, whatever you want to call it, on the House side, but more important, chairman of the subcommittee on technology of the House Committee on Science. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Morella. Chairman. Thank you. You see, we get used to coming and going, and we try to do it without pomp and circumstance and uh, uh, kind of um, recognition. But I'm pleased to be here um, as, as chairman of the House Science Committee's Technology Subcommittee. I am pleased to join. The Committee on Government Reforms, Government Management, Information and Technology Subcommittee in this important hearing to explore the impact of the year 2000 computer problem upon critical components of our nation's transportation system. Our transportation system consists of many interlocking components supported by a complicated aviation infrastructure and 5.5 million miles of public roads, rail track, waterways, and pipelines. Over the years, advanced technologies and computers have been implemented by the transportation sector to improve efficiency. Inadvertently, its reliance on technology also exposes the transportation sector to significant Y2K risks. Clearly, transportation and the movement of people and goods is absolutely vital to our nation. We simply cannot afford to allow the mobility of our society to be disrupted by the Millennium Bug. The Office of Management and Budget, the General Accounting Office, and the Inspector General, as well as the Congress, have been very critical of the Department of Transportation's year 2000 efforts to date. Most of the criticism is due to the fact that the Department and the FAA did not begin to seriously address the extent of their year 2000 problem until February of 1998, much too late. For its part, I must say that the Federal Aviation Administration, under the leadership of Administrator Jane Garvey, has been very forthright in recognizing its mistakes of the past. So I'm pleased to commend Administrator Garvey and the agency for the remarkable progress it has made in the last year. However, the job is not finished. There is still much work to do. Currently, the FAA has implemented Y2K changes in roughly one-third of its air traffic control systems at its, at its field sites. The remaining two-thirds are more complex and have to be installed at 3,000 different locations over the next three months. In addition to making sure that their own internal systems work, the FAA has also got to coordinate its efforts with airports, international organizations, and other federal agencies. There's still much to do in a very short amount of time to ensure that the right Y2K solutions are put into place. And while I have confidence in their leadership, I'm convinced that it's critical for the department and the FAA to work proactively with all transportation stakeholders in the development of contingency plans that ensure that the transportation of people, goods, and services are not significantly impaired on January 1, 2000 and beyond. So I am pleased that today we have a very distinguished panel of witnesses before us. I look forward to their comments, their recommendations, the fact that this is the fourth hearing we've held on transportation in the year 2000 
underscores its importance to our subcommittees and to our nation. We all share the same goal of a seamless transition to the year 2000. The American people expect no less. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And without objection, the opening statement of the ranking minority member, Mr. Turner of Texas, will be put in the record at this point. We now begin with our first witness, Mr. Joel Wilmerson, the director of the Civil Agencies Information Systems of the General Accounting Office. Mr. Wilmerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairwoman Morello, thank you for inviting GAO to testify today on DOT's Y2K readiness. As requested, I'll briefly summarize our statement and in particular focus on the Y2K readiness of the Federal Aviation Administration. Over the past year, FAA has made tremendous progress on Y2K. After a very slow start, FAA now has a strong management structure, an overall Y2K strategy, detailed standards and guidance, schedules and milestones for key activities, and a draft business continuity and contingency plan. Despite this progress, FAA still has a long ways to go. Trying to play catch up after such a slow start especially given the complexity and magnitude of FAA systems environment is an enormous undertaking. For example, many of FAA's mission critical systems are not due to be implemented until after OMB's deadline of this month. Several of these are among FAA's most critical systems. FAA also faces the challenge of making sure that validation of systems is sufficient and complete. In reviewing reports and test documentation for a sample of six mission-critical air traffic systems, we found that validation of three was supported. However, we found one other system's testing to be insufficient, and two systems lacked supporting documentation to determine whether testing was adequate. For example, for the automated radar terminal or ARTS 3A system, which provides aircraft position and flight plan information to controllers, FAA's validation may have been premature. This system continues to rely on a 1960s vintage computer. Home computers available today are 250 times the memory of this computer. Ten years ago, we reported on the flight safety risks associated with this old computer and recommended to FAA that it pursue alternatives to replace the system. However, this computer is still used by air traffic controllers at over 50 locations. In looking at this system for Y2K compliance, we found shortcomings in the analysis of the software, testing, and the contractor's determination of compliance. FAA faces other challenges. It still needs to deploy about 75 systems to hundreds of air traffic facilities. Concurrently rolling out numerous system changes to multiple sites will be time-consuming and resource-intensive, and FAA's acknowledge that schedules are tight with no room for delays. Data exchanges represent another major challenge for FAA. It reports more than 1,000 in its inventory and more than 100 requiring modification. We're continuing to review FAA's progress in this area. End-to-end -end testing of multiple systems that have individually been deemed compliant is another key activity. FAA has made progress on this since our last testimony and now has developed detailed end-to-end -end testing plans that we are continuing to review. In addition to the risks of its internal systems, FAA is also at risk that external systems will fail. For example, we recently reported on airports' efforts to address Y2K. Of the 334 airports responding to our survey, about one-third reported that they would complete their preparations by June 30th. The other two-thirds either planned on a later completion date or did not have an estimated date. And half of these did not have contingency plans for any of their core business functions. Because of the risk of system failures, whether from internal systems or reliance on external partners and suppliers, FAA needs a comprehensive business continuity and contingency plan to help ensure continuing operations. FAA has drafted such a plan and intends to release four more iterations of this plan throughout the year. That concludes a summary of my statement, and I'd be pleased to address any questions you may have. 
We uh, thank you very much for that very uh, succinct statement. Uh, we're going to go through all of the witnesses first, and then we'll have questions for all panelists. I'm delighted to present now the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Transportation, Mortimer L. Downey. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Horn, Chairwoman Morella, for this opportunity to report on the Department of Transportation's efforts to resolve the Y2K problem. I have a longer written statement, which I'd like to uh, submit for the record. Yeah, automatically all statements are put in the record the minute I mention your name. Saves uh, us a lot of time. Thank you. I'm here today fully confident that all DOT's vital computer systems will effectively make the transition on January 1st, 2000. I'm sure most of you realize that OMB has classified DOT as an agency that is making limited progress and that congressional evaluations have continually ranked us at the low end of government. While I understand how these determinations are made, they should not be taken as showing any lack of effort or commitment. Indeed, extraordinary effort is being applied to this challenge by many dedicated DOT employees, including Ms. Garvey and her staff, and the IG's office, whose seal of approval goes on before any of our reports go out. We also appreciate the role of GAO, the questions they raise, as well as the model plans that they've provided to guide our efforts. As of last Friday, March 12th, 64 percent of the Department's 607 mission critical systems were Y2K compliant, as compared with our February report of 53 percent. And since this rate of progress is not linear, I should note that 85 percent are projected to be compliant by March 31st. The FAA projects completion of its work by the schedule that they had set, which is the end of June 1999, and they have met their other goals to date. At that time, end of June, approximately 99 percent of the department systems will be compliant. Those systems projected to be completed after June belong to the United States Coast Guard. The Coast Guard has scheduled completion of its final system, the Valdez Alaska Vessel Traffic System, for October 1999. Due to complicated logistics and the weather conditions in Alaska, it is not possible to accelerate this project any further. I'll continue to work closely with all of our DOT administrators to ensure the success of our remediation efforts. But even with confidence that we have that our goals will be reached, we are preparing and will continue to refine comprehensive business continuity and contingency plans for each of our administrations to ensure that vital services will continue to operate, whatever the cause might be for any system failure. With respect to the broader challenges, we have aggressively reached out to our transportation partners, domestic and international, in all modes, land, sea, and air, and we would be happy to comment on those today. There has been a productive exchange of information, which will continue, and we will inform this committee and the public of any potential areas of concern. In conclusion, I'd like to reiterate the commitment that Secretary Slater and I have to ensuring that all DOT systems will operate properly before, during, and after the millennium change, and we will keep you advised of our progress over the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Be thank to thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we'll now move to uh, Ms. Garvey, very distinguished uh, administrator in the past and at currently uh, the administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration. Thank you very much, Chairman Horn and Chairwoman Morell. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to address the Y2K efforts of the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, let me say at the outset that we have made tremendous progress, and I appreciate GAO's comments in particular. Uh, we've made tremendous progress since I first appeared before this committee in February of 1998. Since that time, we have worked virtually around the clock to make sure that our skies would be safe and that air traffic will be efficient as possible come midnight December 31st. Within the past year, we've caught up with uh, much of the rest of federal government, and I believe that we may have surpassed the expectations of many people. I realize, Mr. Chairman, that you and members of this committee still have some concerns about our progress, and I hope that I can answer some of those concerns uh, today. Currently, the agency is in the validation uh, phase during which all repaired systems must be tested to ensure that all the work accomplished during the renovation phase is complete, is correct, and is consistent. 
As of February 28th, we had validated almost 80% of our mission critical systems. We fully expect to complete validation for 100% of all of our systems by March 31st. That's mission critical and non-mission critical. Our validation process includes an independent verification and validation review by an outside contractor, as well as some very uh, helpful work from the IG's office. It also includes comprehensive end-to-end -end tests, which test the interrelationships of our systems and whether the individual fixes uh, will actually work together as a whole. In particular, we will be conducting an end-to-end -end test at FAA's operational facilities in December, Colorado on April 10th. I expect to be there for that end-to-end -end test. Mm. As you know, after a system has been validated, it progresses to the implementation phase for key site testing and deployment. We've scheduled implementation to be completed, as the Deputy Secretary said, by June 30th, 1999. And let me also stress that while we will complete implementation by June 30th, we will continue to test, to retest our systems for as long as possible and as rigorously as we can to make absolutely sure that we're, we are prepared. Let me briefly mention our agency's contingency plan. The key to a successful contingency plan is involvement, we know, of our labor partners. Last October, the FAA briefed representatives from several unions on our contingency plan. That was followed by a series of workshops, a series of meetings from October to December, resulting in the draft version of the contingency plan. Uh, as uh, GAO has testified, that plan will be released, the first plan, on April 15th. Now, we will continue to review that plan, to revise it as needed. And we're working very closely with uh, our labor unions on that issue. It's important, we think, to have a good contingency plan facility by facility. So we see it as an evolutionary uh, process. Within the aviation industry, we've sponsored several industry days, which bring together key stakeholders from all sectors of the aviation industry. In addition, at the request of the President's Council on Y2K Conversion, we established an aviation industry Y2K steering group and an FAA outreach team. The purpose of this effort is to identify the issues, to develop a coordinated approach to solutions, and finally, to avoid duplication of effort. The steering committee is cheer chaired by the FAA, and membership includes leaders from a number of aviation trade organizations. The committee we meets biweekly, and is responsible for keeping government and industry executives informed of the status of the Y2K effort. Airport readiness is another area of our outreach, and I know this is a concern to members of the committee given the GAO's recent report on airport readiness. Let me say that uh, GAO has, I think, appropriately raised some concerns in this area. I want you to know that the FAA is doing everything within our regulatory powers, and even beyond that, to help airports achieve Y2K compliance. We are focused first and foremost on those elements that have the greatest effect on airport safety and security. We've provided a list of commonly used airfield equipment that uses computers or embedded microchips. We've set criteria for verifying Y2K readiness of airport equipment, and we've detailed a 10-person FAA team to monitor Y2K progress by airport operators. The FAA wants to ensure in fact, we must ensure that the airports achieve compliance with our safety regulations, even if they cannot be fully Y2K compliant. Internationally, our work encompasses several efforts. Last April, the FAA in, um, issued a Y2K international project plan outlining an effective strategy of cooperation and coordination with our international partners. We are working very closely with the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, and the International Air Transport Association. An FAA employee has been assigned to work full-time with ICAO in their Montreal, uh, Canada office to offer guidance and support for their Y2K coordination efforts. Both the Deputy Secretary and I had an opportunity on individual uh, occasions to be briefed in detail in Montreal over the last two weeks. Uh, last September, I represented the FAA at the ICAO General Assembly in Montreal, where the United States sponsored two resolutions. Both resolutions, I'm pleased to say, were accepted. One directs the ICAO Secretary General to develop and to publish standard Y2K assessment criteria that was completed and issued at the end of January. The second resolution urges states to submit to ICAO the status of their Y2K readiness. 
That information must be reported to ICAO by June 30, 1999. FAA has also initiated informal working groups with different international entities to solve common Y2K problems. We know that cooperation between Canada, Mexico, and the United States is critical in order to ensure that the North American air transportation system does not suffer malfunctions on January 1st. Our three countries have agreed to share information on national efforts regarding air navigation systems. Let me say in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, that while I'm very proud of the progress that we've made to date, we are not overconfident. We continue to work diligently on our own Y2K challenges while supporting the efforts of the aviation industry as best as possible. We've overcome many obstacles to get where we are today, but we know that many challenges lie ahead. I continue to remind the Y2K team, whom I think has done an extraordinary job, that we've got to stay the course that each benchmark, each inch mark, if you will, is critical. Each milestone is critical. That concludes my statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be happy to answer any questions with my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a very succinct state statement also. We're now honored to have with us the Inspector General of the Department of Transportation, Kenneth Mead. Are we still in the 20th year of Inspector Generals, or did that finish with 98? But this is a vital resource in our government, so proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chairwoman. First, a little over a year ago, we testified before these same subcommittees. Our report then was not at all encouraging. We testified that FAA was then seven months behind the schedule in assessing just the scope of its Y2K problems, let alone repairing the problems. There were serious questions whether the computer used to control high-altitude air traffic called the host computer would even make it to the year 2000. And FAA's schedule for fixing its computers was literally the 11th hour or November of this year, leaving almost no cushion. We made a series of recommendations at that hearing, chief among them establishing strong central management and moving up completion milestones to June 99. FAA responded, Mr. Chairman, and responded well to all of these recommendations. Looking back, uh, that February seems to me to mark a turning point. Commitment leadership by the Secretary, the Deputy Secretary, the FAA Administrator, Mr. Koskinen, and others, including the oversight of this committee and GAO, have resulted unambiguously in a great deal of progress. Overall, we have a much higher level of confidence today than we did a year ago that DOT mission critical systems such as air traffic control will indeed be Y2K compliant and that there will be sufficient room in the schedule to address computer interface problems that may develop. However, the job's not nearly done. We can't let up. There's still much to do. Here's where matters stand. DOT has 607 mission critical systems. About 300 were okay to begin with. 309 had Y2K problems that had to be fixed. All but five of these have been to use the term of art, renovated or fixed. But this does not mean the fix has been installed at all field facilities that have a particular system. DOT, as has been noted, will not be OMB's March 31 milestones to have all systems compliant. And compliant means not only fixed, but fixed, tested, and installed in all locations. DOT expects to be 85% compliant by March 31, 99% by June, and a couple outliers uh, by late October. FAA and the Coast Guard have 90 of the 91 systems that won't be compliant by March 31. I'd like to move to the display chart that each of you have to explain more fully what this means. First, our numbers are as of 228. Uh, that's the last we had to have a cutoff to validate. But this is a moving target. Things have changed even since then. The 85% compliant figure on March 31 that you'll hear about applies to the total universe of the 600-odd DOT mission critical systems, which includes systems that didn't need any fixes or repair. But let's focus for a moment, as does that chart, on only the 309 systems for which repairs were required. First, for FAA, all of the 151 systems, I don't know if your eyes were as good enough to Read that, Mr. Chairman. We can read it. Mine aren't. <laughs> but for FAA, all of the 151 systems that had to be fixed are fixed. 
Most have been tested. The same is true for over 90% of the Coast Guard's systems that had to be fixed. The Coast Guard has the five systems that as of the 28th of February needed to be fixed. And only two of its 66 systems that required repairs have been fixed, tested, and installed at all field locations. Coast Guard bears watching, but we're certain they're up to the task. Third, the tested number of FAA systems, that's the number 116, means that at least one of each mission critical system that was repaired has been tested. Once it's, in test, once it's tested, FAA has to install the fix in all units at air traffic facilities in the field. There are multiple units of the same computer system throughout the United States. In other words, the same repair or fix that was made to the computer system in the laboratory must now be made to the same computer system at air traffic facilities throughout the United States. That's now the real challenge, Mr. Chairman, for both FAA and in fact the Coast Guard to install the fix in the field and make sure it works. To illustrate, as shown in the red print on that chart, for the 65 air traffic systems that needed to be repaired, one third have been fixed, tested, and installed throughout the country. That means the fixes for the remaining 44 air traffic systems have to be installed at field locations between now and the end of June. That equates to several thousand computer locations. For the Coast Guard, 64 of 66 system fixes must now be deployed to afloat or ashore activities by the end of June. Also, we're paying special attention to the val validation numbers, which is testing the fix. We found a need for FAA to be a bit more disciplined in providing support for the test results. I think Mr. Williamson has already alluded to that. I point these out not to detract, Mr. Chairman, in any way from the progress that's been made, but rather to illustrate the scope and the importance of the remaining work. Second, with this second point I'd like to make overall is that with the short time remaining, DOT has to finalize workable contingency plans. We're concerned that FAA's two major unions, the controllers and maintenance technicians, still need to play a more active role in the composition of these plans. These are the people who, after all, have to continue operations if unexpected failures occur. Third, moving to the industry. DOT, the Coast Guard, Transit, FAA, and the industry itself have done a good job of injecting a high level of Y2K awareness. Can more be done? Yes, absolutely. Our sense of red industry readiness in the aviation area is that major passenger and cargo carriers are managing Y2K preparation quite well. But we think, and I'm speaking here only for the Office of Inspector General, that they should have to certify to the department by November 1st, large and small alike, that their systems are Y2K compliant. The Federal Transit Administration is requiring this of transit properties. We think the FAA should require that as well. We have to make certifications to the secretary and the secretary in turn to the Office of Management and Budget. Um, I don't see any persuasive reason why the regulated entities, entities who carry passengers and cargo should not do likewise. GAO has already touched on airports and I won't. Fourth uh, point I'd like to make is the international arena is one of continued concern. DOT has been working with various international organizations and although awareness has increased greatly, there are at this hour far too many unknowns in major parts of the globe. We believe it's time to develop a policy as to whether U.S. carriers or U.S. co-chair flights will be allowed to fly to countries that are not known to be Y2K compliant. Finally, I, I'd like to close just with a point that we in the Office of Inspector General stand ready to help in any way we can. We found that at all levels of the department, regardless of the operating administration, an openness and support for the oversight and checking and responsiveness to the recommendations that we've made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my co-chairman and I will be alternating and questioning about five minutes each until we uh, get down through all 200 questions we have prepared here. Uh, don't worry, it's only 190. Uh, let, me, let me ask uh, the secretary uh, a couple of things here. 
do you concur that those are accurate figures as far as you see? Those are generally developed by your people and the IG has gone in to look at it. And I'd ask Mr. Meade, are you pretty sure those figures are sound? Yes, sir, as of, uh, the, end of, as of the end of February. Mr. Well, Downey alluded to some more recent figures that we haven't validated yet, and that's why I was not sourcing those. Well, February 12th was, of course, the quarterly report, and that's what we based our judgment on. Right. So we, what is, is there anything new that wasn't in this chart of the Inspector General? So we issue a monthly report to OMB that is val validated by the Inspector General. That was the report that would bring us up to 60 to 57 percent. The 64 percent was our informal view as of Friday, and before you get a monthly report at the end of this month that will also be validated by the IG, but that's the one we expect to be at 85 percent. Uh, besides uh, seeing how rapidly an agency is uh, implementing the testing and getting full compliance, we had four other criteria of uh, which the Department of Transportation was simply, quote, in progress, unquote. Whether it was 1 percent progress or 200 percent progress, we don't know, but let me just go through them. On the contingency plan, it was in progress. What is the contingency plan of the Department of Transportation? There will be about a dozen separate contingency plans, one for each of the major administrations. By the end of this month, I think most of them will be complete in draft. Some of them will be issued in final. All of them will continue to be worked on right up to the end of the year as we uh, uh, work with other partners, because these will be contingency plans not only for things that should be within our control, but for contingencies that would be beyond our control. Could you give me an example of one system that you have a contingency plan for? We have a, a full published contingency plan for the Federal Railroad Administration. It covers uh, the internal systems of FRA. It also covers our work with the industry on safety-related matters for the industry. And we can uh, provide that to well, you. Well, what is the particular uh, system you have that is the contingency? Is it another system in another agency or what? Well, for example, um, in, federal, in Federal Rail, where one of the major systems is managing our field inspection activities, we have fallback of doing it by paper and pencil if we need mm -hmm. to. But we want to be sure that the business function will be able to continue. Have uh, people in the Federal uh, Railway Administration, have they uh, uh, been checking on microchips and what it might mean to their signaling? Yes, throughout the industry, uh, uh, we have worked with uh, the railroads, large and small, and have found that signal systems, um, locomotives, crossing gates, and all of the other safety-related um, equipment within, within the industry should perform well. well. While there are numerous microchips, they are all event-sensitive and not date-sensitive, so we should see those systems working. So there's no danger there that a signal see, would be tripped wrongly? We, we see no dangers there. Uh, the thing that the industry is continuing to work on, uh, and we're uh, monitoring their progress, is the interrelated systems they have for managing freight cars and managing the flow of traffic. Uh, those have to work not only within each railroad, but across the entire industry. Uh, the American Association of Railroads has taken the lead on that and is working with each of the major carriers to be sure that their systems uh, uh, we'll work together. The uh, current report we have from them is they're about 85 percent complete with the implementation and expect uh, to meet a June 30th uh, time period. Besides completion, our second criteria on the February 12th reports was the degree to which your telecommunications uh, situation would be able to survive the computers on this. Is that true? We are uh, including those telecommunication systems that are under our own control, such as FAA and Coast Guard systems, as part of our modernization and, and implementation efforts. We have to work with the telecommunication carriers where we are involved in using commercial systems. We're continuing to work with them along with FCC and the Gen uh, General Services Administration to be sure that those systems will be working. So you have your own internal systems and your own switches that if, say, Bell Atlantic or whatever it is goes under, 
because of some computer glitch in their switch, you have your own way of communicating with most of your people? In some cases we do. In some cases they are directly linked through the commercial system. In that case we have a risk of uh, problems with the commercial system. That's one of the reasons for having our contingency plans. Should an issue be under control, such as a Bell Atlantic or an MCI switch fail, we have to have alternate means. And typically that involves having alternate routings for the, uh, for the data flow. Well, those of us who were around when President Kennedy was assassinated recall that everybody picked up the phone to, to talk to their loved ones or whatever it was, and uh, the switches just broke down. Right. Have we looked at that situation in the disaster area since? In California, it'll be an earthquake or something. That's something that uh, working through the uh, Y2K Council with John Koskinen, uh, the communicate, telecommunications working group is uh, involved in that discussion. And there are priority uses and priority users, and I think we'll have an ability to be sure that the priority users can be met. We cannot assure that every person in America will have a dial tone on their phone. But I think How about the, uh, uh, safety sensitive uh, yeah, activities could be met. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're working on that. Uh, our third criteria was embedded systems, and how, to what degree are you getting into those systems and seeing what these little microchips will do? We're working that through not only the things that are in our own control, but through the industries. As I mentioned, we've been through the railroad industry. Uh, we have worked with aviation. Aviation is a uh, uh, easier one to work with because FAA maintains configuration control on all aircraft and really can tell us where there are chips and they have found the areas where uh, changes need to be made. We are concerned in the maritime area because there are thousands of ships out there. They are all unique. And uh, at a later point, I can tell you what we're doing internationally on that. We held a conference in London recently. Uh, we have checked out the transit systems and we are now surveying the auto industry who has told us informally there are no chips in our automobiles that we should worry about, but we would like to get uh, a uh, uh, more formal response from them that says uh, no individual automobile will uh, go out of control because of a chip. Well, that's good to know. I have a 1988 Mercury, and uh, I love it. And I bought it strictly because of that dashboard. <laughs> and something's gone wrong already because a third of it doesn't show anything. But that's OK. Just keep after them. Uh, just one last question on this, and then Ms. Morella. Uh, external data exchange, that was our fourth criteria. What have you got to do on that one? Uh, we're working through our external data exchange. I think the FAA is probably the most critical layer with interchanges with the industry and with the Weather Service. My recollection is of about a 1,000 uh, areas of interchange, there were roughly 100 that might have problems, and something like half of those have now been corrected. But we are working through all of our all of our interchanges. Other areas that are important, uh, maybe not sen safety sensitive, but important, are our flow of funds to the states for all of our grant programs. The states are very anxious to be sure that uh, those payment flows can be made, and we will be working end to end tests with them as well. Now I'm delighted to yield six minutes to my co-chairman, <laughs> Ms. Morella. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I must say. This is a situation where I see very, very honest uh, criticism of the system, um, you know, with GAO, Inspector General, um, with our Deputy Secretary of DOT and our Administrator of FAA, criticism and cooperation too. I think it's, it's probably a, a, a singular exemplary example that could be followed, particularly because as we look at FAA, it started, as we've all mentioned, so very, very late. Um, Ms. Garvey, I'd like to ask you to, 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 to give us uh, your response. Will FAA be ready by June 30th with contingency plans? Yes, uh, Congresswoman, we will be ready with contingency plan. Our first volume, if you will, or our first version is going to be issued April 15th, and it contains two volumes. Um, but again, those plans are going to be revised. We expect a second one to come out this summer and then a third uh, later into the fall. And the, and the whole um, premise is that we will continue to work it. I think one of the issues, and I might add, by the way, that I think the involvement of the unions to date, and I, I 
absolutely hear what Mr. Mead says, that that must continue and we must involve them again and again. But I think the involvement to date has made the plan a better plan. And uh, I expect that we'll continue to work at facility by facility so that we are, we are prepared. I, I want to publicly commend both uh, Mr. McNally and Mr. Fanfalone for their personal involvement. It really has involved the highest levels of the union. I appreciate that. Very That's much. another element of the partnership that I commend. And I, I'm just so pleased that you're all working together cooperatively. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear about the fact that you also believe that you will meet that deadline. I wanted to ask the question about the fact that you plan to conduct a lot of end-to-end -end tests in the coming weeks. When will the FAA interface with foreign air traffic control organizations as part of an end-to-end -end test? Uh, Congresswoman, we've begun some of that testing now, particularly with Canada. NAV Canada has been a very active partner with us. Um, in, in uh, conducting those tests. We have some more that are scheduled this month in March, I think around the 23rd, but in that time frame, uh, more tests with, uh, with Canada, and uh, we have a bilateral scheduled uh, in May to talk with Canada and Mexico, actually a trilateral, to talk about the very issue of, of testing, and we're continuing with a number of other international partners on, on testing through the uh, spring and early summer, and I can give you exactly what that schedule includes, but includes a number of countries in Latin America as well as, of course, Mexico and Canada and European countries as well. I would be happy to follow that in sort of specific uh, uh, schedules. In, in uh, just expanding that question just a bit more, what steps uh, will the FAA take to ensure that U.S. air carriers or U.S. code share uh, flights will only fly to countries that are proven to be Y2K compliant. And then I'm going to ask if Mr. Williamson and Mr. Mead would also comment on the, um, uh, the, the questions sure. that I've asked. Maybe Mr. Downey would like to too. Uh, let me just mention, I think the code sharing, I may defer to the Deputy Secretary uh, for that answer, although I will say, again, just to emphasize the work we're doing with ICAO, and we expect that the information that we all have internationally June 30th is going to be very critical. I was briefed in Montreal on Friday, and I was pleased to see the work that ICAO and IATA have been able to do to date, but I think we're going to have some very, uh, uh, very hard decisions post June 30th together with the State Department, uh, with, the, with the industry, to, once we, uh, I think, fully understand what the, what the situation is, we will have some, some uh, uh, perhaps difficult decisions. But I am pleased with the information that's coming in and pleased with the forthrightness uh, that uh, really I think all of the countries have, have approached this issue. If I could just follow Secretary up on, Downey, the, on the code share issue, which is an economic issue. Um, we will be looking at that same information and together with state make two levels of public information available. One would be travel advisories uh, with respect to foreign countries and this would not only be with respect to their aviation systems but generally uh, the state of play in those, in those countries. With respect to U.S. carrier or code shares where U.S. carrier tickets are being used on a foreign airline, I believe we will look at safety as the issue, not necessarily Y2K compliance, but assurance of safety, as we do today. We do not allow U.S. carriers to fly into any circumstance where we believe the air travel system is unsafe, and this would be one consideration as part of that. How do you, che how do you check the safety and compliance of international carriers? Do you rely on what they tell you? Or? We uh, do two things. We get information from the carriers. We put a lot more reliance in our review and ICAO's review of the certifying authority in the local country. Um, we want to be sure that if country X certifies its carriers and its airports as safe, that they actually have a good regime for doing that. We publish our evaluations of those regimes, and we uh, take uh, with considerable uh, doubt um, any statement that comes from a uh, uh, country whose certification regime is less than less than adequate. Do you, you feel some countries um, uh, will will be closed 
their airports, thinking of Indonesia, countries of that nature, that they will be closed? We will know better uh, after July when we get the information from ICAO and before September when we have a chance to fully evaluate it. Mm -hmm. Um, could I just ask if Mr. Uh, Williamson and Mr. Mead wanted to add any quick comments to the series of questions? Just quickly add in terms of contingency plans, we think FAA has made very good progress in this area. They've put together an initial draft framework uh, that we think looks pretty good. I think their strategy of going forward with additional iterations makes a lot of sense, especially as they uh, get more detail on the exact nature of the contingencies that they may want to activate. So I think overall, very good progress in that area. Uh, likewise, in the end-to-end -end testing area that you mentioned, uh, they've got some good guidance put together um, and uh, some good strategies for testing some of the most critical air traffic systems. Uh, and we're going to continue evaluating that uh, to make sure that indeed as much thorough testing is done as possible on those most essential air traffic systems. Thank you. Mr. Mee, did you have any final comments? Yeah, just two, uh, two I would uh, just ditto uh, everything Mr. Williamson said. I would underscore, though, that with respect to the business continuity plans, that uh, I, I think we have to pay special attention, as the administrator, uh, I'm certain, is, to the involvement of the both the maintenance technician union and the controllers, because the, at the individual system level, if they have to go to manual operations, uh, you, you definitely want their concurrence, and I'm certain they'll have it. Second, on the code sharing, uh, the more we look at this, I, I think that it, the public disclosure or advisories uh, may turn out not to be sufficient, and that will some, need some sort of policy about whether U.S. airlines or people they're in privity with, the code share airlines, should be flying there. And we'll know a lot more in midsummer about the readiness level of these foreign countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just for the record, uh, when you hear the word ICAO, it isn't a boxer knocking somebody out in the <laughs> ring. Uh, it's the International Civil Aviation Organization, which, I, if I remember, goes back to the League of Nations and was inherited by the United Nations. And that's where most people can get together and battle things out on a, get an international policy, and it's a very worthwhile organization. Let me uh, ask a few questions here uh, that I want to inv also involve the IG and the GAO, in other words, the Inspector General and someone from the General Accounting Office. Uh, the FAA is established June 30th to have its computer system uh, be ready to go. Do you think the FAA will make the June 30th deadline Mr. Mead, will they? Yes, I do. I would not be surprised if uh, there are some last-minute testing issues that may extend it a bit past that date, but that's why we established they moved it up from November to June to allow that cushion for unexpected problems. Uh, Mr. Wilmington? I think it'll be extremely difficult to meet that date uh, with the kind of thoroughness of testing that we would expect on individual systems. Well, if they won't, why, uh, why won't they make the deadline? What are the factors that affect that? The major factor affecting that is so many systems to implement at so many locations. Uh, late last week, the FAA program manager estimated to us that he had about 4,500 events between now and the end of June. Each event means one system at one location. Multiply that by 4,500 in a little over three months and have it all go the way it's supposed to go uh, with that many systems and that many locations, extremely difficult to do. If FA can pull it off, great. Well, we hope they can. Uh, I'm not sure they can uh, with the thoroughness of testing that we'll be looking for. Yeah, I, I would rather, Mr. Chairman, if there are, if we see in our monitoring and validation that Mr. Downey alluded to, uh, discloses cutting of corners on testing and that sort of thing, I'd rather see it slip by two or three weeks rather than come up with a nice rosy report only to have to later uh, back off of it. And I think everybody at the table would share that view. Well, I think everybody up here shares that view also. Let's do it right. Uh, are those in the regional centers or are those in the actual airport that these, quote, events, unquote, 
take place. A range of facilities from en route centers to terminal radar approach control facilities to um, um, automated flight service stations. I, we counted up the different types of facilities and came up with a number in the neighborhood of 654 different types of facilities, some with maybe one system, some with multiple systems. That's, that's a huge challenge for any organization um, to have to deal with in a uh, little over three months. Ms. Garvey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, let me say we, we do not minimize the challenge ahead of us. It is, uh, it is a big challenge, but I really do think we have it laid out in such a way, in a very methodical and a thoughtful way that will allow us to meet that challenge. Uh, there are 100 events per sector. There are 33 sectors. Let me sort of break it down that way. We've got 33 sectors. We think there are about 100 uh, events per sector. We've got the best technicians uh, in the world who know this system, have grown up with this system. In addition, we've got about 250 specialists also assigned to it. So while it's an enormous challenge, we think we have it laid out by sector in such a way that it can be met. But I would certainly uh, agree and, and restate what the Inspector General said, that if we have any doubts, we certainly want to make sure that our testing is accurate and, and, and valid. And, and we welcome the, the involvement of both GAO and the Inspector General in, in, in that effort. Any other comments to be made on this? In other words, you all agree if it's slippage of a few weeks, don't let's worry about it just so we get the job done. Let me ask None you this. of us will stop worrying until the job is done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, on some background here, one of the first strategies in finding out how a system will perform through the year 2000 date change is to contact the vendor of the key components to determine if the vendor will certify that their products are year 2000 compliant. FAA did not do this on the so-called ARTS-Roman 3A hardware. What are we calling this, ARTS 3? ARTS 3. Well, I've got to address an arts group today. I'll try to f knock this from my mind and not confuse them, but go ahead. Now, why didn't we do this? Well, actually, Mr. Chairman, we had some very intensive uh, um, testing done with Lockheed Martin and also actually with the, with the firm that originally uh, put together the Arts Three, And we've had lengthy discussions with GAO as recently as Friday. We think the testing and validation is solid and good, and we expect to get actually a letter today from Lockheed Martin to that effect. But, but we also agree that if GAO has some concerns, uh, Lockheed Martin has said they'd be happy to run those testings, testing again so that we, we can all have a level of comfort that, that we need. So we stand by the testing. Lockheed Martin does the validation, but we're happy to run it again if that, uh, uh, if that would help. Mr. Wilmington, how do you feel about this? To the extent that the contractor in this case can provide a certification that this particular piece of hardware manufactured uh, more than 30 years ago is indeed Y2K compliant, that will give uh, the Federal Aviation Administration a greater level of assurance that issues uh, will not come up. In terms of the software, there does need to be some additional testing done. Um, the report that's been done thus far by the contractor indicates that the year is represented by two digits, not four. Uh, there are some Y2K ramifications possible, and we would like to see more thorough testing of the radar tracks in particular uh, to make sure that that issue uh, doesn't surface. Again, one thing to keep in mind here is you vary the level of testing depending on the criticality of the system. This system is absolutely essential. It provides flight information uh, and, and identification information to controllers, and therefore we think the bar needs to be pretty high. Well, does it also have to be earlier? As I look at the data from our own staff, uh, these systems support critical FAA functions, as you noted, including aircraft surveillance, communications, and weather data processing. Yet 12 of these systems will be among the last of the FAA systems to be completed. Is that a problem? Well, it is something that we wanted to point out in the statement in, in terms of making sure that FAA focuses, uh, as I testified in August, on the most critical air traffic systems and make sure that uh, the thoroughness of testing is especially focused on those particular systems. So it, it, it is noted that they are later in the process, but again, as mentioned a few minutes ago, to the extent that it takes even a little longer than the current milestones to make sure that they are thoroughly tested, uh, we would support that. Any other comments? 
I, I guess, Kirby. Mr. Chairman, just again to reiterate, uh, Lockheed Martin is very comfortable with it, but we'd be happy to continue those discussions and further testing if necessary. Okay. Ms. Morello. Uh. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to first of all pick up on the contingency plan concept. Um, Ms. Garvey, if Mr. Willemson's suggestions that contingency plans could be in a little difficulty with regard to meeting the deadline. Which contingency plans for what particular sector? Can we be a little bit specific? Uh, Congresswoman, the, the, we would focus on, there are about six systems that are critical, including the ARTS-3, uh, as GAO has, has testified, and in addition, HOST, for example, is very, very important to us as well. So we would focus on those uh, particular systems that are really critical to the uh, to the working of the system, the heart and soul of the system. For example, host, if host fails, we have a backup system um, that would come into place. And, and ultimately, if we uh, are concerned enough, we would increase the separation or uh, slow up the, the traffic uh, to some degree. So those are, those are the kinds of contingency plans, but you can look at a system like host, see what the backup system is and see what the backup to that is, with the ultimate being separation or further separation of the aircraft, actual delays if we need to. Mr. Williamson, you want to comment on that? I would, again, the focus that FAA's had on the contingency planning uh, over the last several months, uh, we've been uh, very supportive of, and they have focused from a business function perspective, that is to look at it uh, from an end-to-end, -end. in this case, for, for example, surveillance of aircraft and making uh, sure that they're still appropriately uh, separated and looking at the various things that could potentially go wrong and if those events realize themselves, what kind of backup uh, uh, they would have in place. And I think they are moving in that uh, direction. They have a good draft uh, in hand uh, that is ready to, to be uh, fleshed out with some more details. I see this is, is really very important because of House of Cards concept. One thing is connected to another. If one topples, the whole situation could be chaotic, and I guess you would agree with that. Yes. And it was just the other day that I talked to some members. It was a conference here on the travel industry, mm. and actually they, they did a uh, reservation uh, check, and they found uh, it was in February, in early February, they, f they found that their reservation system came through without a hitch for reservations, uh, you know, January 2000 and, and beyond. Um, however, they are obviously concerned about whether or not they will be able to fulfill these reservation contracts with their clients. So I guess I would ask you, in terms of the connections, what about uh, luggage systems at airports? Um, are you overseeing the airport's uh, uh, alternative power sources, I mean, the electric generators? Um, what about, you know, other terminal systems? Would you like to comment Let on Let me make a, a brief comment specifics. about that, uh, Chairwoman. The, um, from our perspective, from the FAA's perspective, we are focused on those systems that are related to safety and security. Uh, airfield lighting, for example, is absolutely critical. The condition of the fire trucks and whether they are actually ready and Y2K compliant. So that's really our focus. It's those it's those elements that are part of the 139 uh, certification process that airports need to go through. However, I will say that um, that as we look at and as we have the joint discussions every other week with industry, many of those other issues are coming up. And I I know that ACI and AAA even. AAAE and even ATA are spending a good deal of time with with the uh, uh, with the airport operators on some of those issues. But our our real really our critical issue is is the safety and security element of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would the rest of you agree? Would you, Mr. Williamson? I think that's the appropriate focus. Again, given uh, there's so much to do and limited time to do it, you got to focus on those most important areas. Yeah, we're so, comfortable that FAA should put its focus on the safety side, but we are also working with the industry because if some of these other systems fail, it could have a significant effect on the movement of commerce and we don't want to see serious delays there. But it is safety first and then the other issues. And we are concerned that some of the airports have not 
really looked at all of the things that they need to look at. So, so you, there are a number of, uh, uh, of entities that need to be looked at that are not within your purview because they don't involve safety, but they certainly could involve inconvenience Absolutely. as uh, minimally. You know, as uh, it, it minimally, and that others should be looking at that. I'm wondering about the cruise industry, Secretary Downey. Is there any any checking on whether or not the cruise ships are Y2K compliant? Coast Guard has been working with uh, all of the elements of the maritime industry and had a very successful conference in London um, earlier this month, at which a code of good practice was agreed to by the industry. Uh, we believe it will be endorsed by the International Maritime Organization, which is usually takes many years to get things agreed to. I think in this case they're going to speed up their process. This will allow the Coast Guard to have a quick checklist of any ship entering U.S. waters uh, uh, and determine quickly what they have done and what they have not done. And under our regime of port state control, we could bar ships that are not ready for the year 2000. So the Coast Guard is the one that has the Coast responsibility Guard has the, for has the has the ability to, to deal with that in U.S. waters. Mm -hmm. and, but you are looking at what they We're are doing. We're looking at it internationally in because it is an international issue. Absolutely right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that uh, very point, some have told us, on it, looking at it on a worldwide basis, that microchips are in the refineries, they're in the ships, they're in the unloading and everything else. To what degree is the Department of Transportation concerned that we can't get a gasoline, a petroleum, an oil supply into this country? We are working with uh, the pipeline industry and the tanker industry and the refineries to assure that there will be a continuity of supply. The question of chips is a concern. We have pretty much ruled out the problem with respect to the pipelines. They've done complete checking. The issue with the ships is a lot more difficult than with aircraft because there's not the kind of tight configuration control. This is why we we're so pleased to get the major elements of the industry together to uh, turn the problem over to them with a clear checklist of what they have to do. We now will know whether tankers, for example, and Intertanko, the uh, trade association, was part of this agreement, will now have a set, a set of steps that each operator can go through and that we can follow up on to see if, in fact, they have been done. But we cannot completely rule out the problem yet, uh, especially in uh, ports all around the world. The cargo cranes, for example, uh, we heard uh, when we met uh, with uh, Mexico um, a few weeks ago that they have been checking in their ports. They found half the cranes are okay, but they haven't been able to verify the other half as well. So Coast Guard will be ready, as they always are, to deal with any emergencies that, that, uh, that are generated and to be sure that we can maintain an adequate flow of critical materials. The Department of Defense has a cooperative relationship with Russia in terms of having our officers and their air defense commands, their officers and ours. Uh, Russia provides most of the energy supply, at least gas, coming out of Russia into Eastern Europe and part of Central Europe. Uh, this whole thing, if something goes awry, is at the winter season. Uh, to what degree is the Department of Transportation offering to help Russia if they have problems? Now, it's primarily a pipeline going there, and maybe we're not worried about pipelines, I gather. But uh, has anything, any exchange been done between this country and Russia? Not formally yet, but I believe there will be discussions at the very senior levels, and certainly the Department will be ready to uh, be part of any team that's, that's, that is provided to Russia. I think that's a good idea because uh, with if that system goes out of whack, you're going to have millions of Europeans freezing. They just won't have the supply for the heat. Uh, let me ask Mr. Wilmotson, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration has contracted with a firm, and I don't know if there's a name for it. It's SAIC. What does that stand for, pray tell? Another acronym that's in Washington? That's how we refer, how most of us refer to Is it. Is this SIAC or what? Just SAIC. SAIC, okay, to perform independent verification and validation activities. In your opinion, are they performing both verification and validation? I think they are, it's, it's an excellent step that FAA took to get such a uh, contractor in to assist them with the effort. Uh, one of the areas that they may want to 
consider uh, having SAIC or another uh, similar contractor also perform for them in addition to double checking, so to speak, on the documentation and paperwork behind certifications. They also may want to go a bit further and, may, and have another independent source rerun some of the tests uh, to see if indeed the same results uh, come out of those tests as uh, the original tests that were done. That's a, uh, especially again, uh, not necessarily for all systems, but those systems that are most essential uh, to the air traffic control system. Uh, what are the potential consequences of not independently validating the system test? Well, one thing an independent test gives you, especially if you can provide that independent tester, if that independent tester has a mentality that we're going to try to find problems here as opposed to, well, let's try to check this box and go on to the next step. Uh, you really need a mentality with that uh, organization that's doing the independent test to have some pretty rigorous test scripts uh, that can identify potential uh, issues uh, that could surface themselves, if not on 1-1-2000 one, one, at, at some of the other uh, critical dates. So I think that's a, an important consideration uh, for FAA to keep in mind. Uh, Mr. Mead, uh, in your February memorandum, you noted the President's Council on the Year 2000 Conversion identified computer security as a potential concern due to the magnitude of year 2000 renovation work that's being performed. So I guess the obvious question is how vulnerable are the department's computer systems to security threats and is the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, particularly vulnerable? I think it's fair to say that uh, FAA, as well as other parts of the department, need to step up, uh, step up their efforts in the computer security area and it's a very formidable undertaking. I know DOT is not the only agency in government facing this issue but just just internally it's it's something FAA faces, the Coast Guard faces, uh, particularly these operational agencies. Is there one administration within the Department of Transportation that is particularly vulnerable or are they all equally vulnerable? Looks like the Railway Administration, for example, doesn't have as many problems as we might have thought they would have. No, uh, I, I think some of our uh, payroll systems, uh, a couple years ago, uh, I think we did it, we tried to do a test, a penetration test, and I, I believe the system was so old, it was difficult to penetrate. And <laughs> you were trying to give inspector generals an increase in pay or what? <laughs> well, I'm, that'd be acceptable too, Mr. Chairman. Somebody's but, 17 year old no. high school student penetrated it, right? Yeah. You know, frankly, uh, even though FAA and the Coast Guard are both operational agencies and have to take care of people's lives in, as part of their daily mission, it's also, so, also true that when you take the Federal Highway Administration, very large amounts of money. And so computer security, I think, is an equal concern across the board at DOT. Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, add a bit on that. The Y2K Council has been working very closely with the Critical Infrastructure Assurance Office, uh, which is part of the National Security Council. And we really view Y2K as a dress rehearsal for what we have to do on computer security, not just in the government, but across all of industry. It's an, it is an important area, and we've learned a lot in the last year about what we need to do. Uh, Mr. Meade triggered in my brain the word, the magic word like Groucho Marx, the Federal Highway Administration. I'm told back in either 1987 or 1989, a very able programmer laid it all out for him and said, we ought to be doing this, just like Social Security did in 1989. And the old boy network just, just gave no credence to a woman programmer, which is nonsense. And what I want to know now is, in 1987-89, the secretary never had a chance to talk about that issue. There was no management system within transportation to get that idea percolating to the top so he could talk, or she could talk, as the case may be. Uh, do, will any of you in these different administrations, rail and Coast Guard and Federal Aviation, have a problem? And I would think the FAA administrator at that time would have nodded the head, yes, sounds like we'd have a problem. 
But it didn't get there. Didn't I get guess there. I would ask the question, has the management lines within the Department of Transportation shaped up from those days? I think one of the things that will help in that regard is the creation of a chief information officer within the department and equivalent positions. Uh, one has just been uh, hired at the FAA. And that cross-cutting network of individuals who have shared concerns, whether it's the CFO on finance or the chief information officer or other comparable activities, do get us more of a sharing of activities. We also uh, try to work better among the administrators to be sure that the line activities are also well coordinated. We have a concept now called 1DOT, and when someone learns something like this, sharing it is viewed as a very important activity uh, within the department. So nothing like this would happen again? I would hope not. Well, we all hope that, but the problem is, is there a, a mechanism to get tough questions up to the top? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see, uh, Ms. Garvey, uh, the Department of Transportation's Chief Information Officer has issued guidance cautioning that the year 2000 windowing technique, which is only a temporary fix, could result in slower system performance. What kind of fixes are the Department and FAA using to ensure that its systems are Y2K ready? Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, you mean the... Well, uh, the, as I understand it, from what staff have said looking around, the Transportation's Chief Information Officer has issued guidance right. concerning the so-called windowing technique, uh, which is only a temporary fix, and it could result in slower system performance. Well, if it's a fix, are, is that going to help the Department and the FAA in the long run to really make sure you've done the job? I think from our perspective, and I may have to turn to staff for this, but, but what we're trying to do is renovate the systems that we have in place. And, and in, are you familiar with that, Ray? Do you want to? Let me turn to Mr. Long and ask. Yeah, Mr. Long, just identify yourself and give us the answer. Director Why don't you FAA. put it up to you? Thank you, pardon. Just want you, you have oh. to get to the mic. I'm Raymond Long. I'm the director of the FAA's Sorry, Year 2000 Ray. Project. I like sitting like this. this um, the FAA is using the windowing technique on our existing legacy older systems. On all of the new systems that are being deployed into the FAA, we're requiring that those contracts be modified to show four-digit date expansion. So the only place we're using windowing is in our legacy or our older systems. We have uh, not tested for system degradation as we're doing the window technique. It has not been a problem up till now because the air traffic control system does not use the date like your microcomputers or your other systems. It is something we can include in our post-implementation activity, though, if, if we felt we needed to. Mr. Wilmington, do you have any comment on this? Windowing is a commonly accepted technique, especially as time grows short and there's not enough time to expand all the date fields. The biggest issue that actually I would be concerned about, rather than a performance issue, is one of data exchanges, because if indeed a particular system has been windowed and we're keep staying with two digits, um, if that particular data is sent to another organization uh, and they are expecting full expansion, if indeed those the relationships and um, bridges have not been worked out, you risk uh, having some um, degraded data going into another system. So, but it's not that it's, it is a generally accepted technique, but like all techniques, it has its, uh, has its risks. In our, in our February uh, comfort letter to the uh, Secretary and Deputy Secretary on this matter, uh, we indicated that the tests uh, on the performance issue should be more robust than they were. Okay, uh, Ms. Morella, eight minutes. <laughs> I ran over. <laughs> So, Equity so is precise. what we engage in. Just like the grading. Thank you. Um, Secretary Downey, um, I represent Montgomery County, Maryland, and uh, Montgomery County, Maryland has been recognized nationally for its advanced transportation management system um, and other technology uh, technologies that are used for transportation. I wondered uh, what you are doing to work with a jurisdiction like that particularly in terms of assisting other localities and jurisdictions uh, with regard to what's been done and what can be done. Uh, Montgomery County has, in fact, been one of our poster children for uh, good mm -hmm. practice and, and 
good progress. We held a workshop in January at the Transportation Research Board, which is the get-together that has really thousands of people from highway and transit management around the country. We got all of the entities together that uh, have concerns about Y2K, and we asked Gordon Ayogi, who is uh, running the emergency center there, to take everyone through what, in fact, they have done, and it was very helpful for us. Uh, the Intelligent Transportation Society of America, ITSA, uh, has been our partner in reaching out to traffic control, uh, traffic information, and other computer-based systems around the country. And uh, we think things are in pretty good shape in that area, but we appreciate the, the help from Montgomery County in ex sharing their experience. Excellent, excellent. Glad you're, you are utilizing that uh, uh, with other jurisdictions. Um, I guess I would ask this question of um, maybe Mr. Mead and Mr. Willemson may want to comment, maybe Ms. Garvey. Actually, most completed and, and planned tests of the air traffic control systems have been done at the FAA's tech center. In the past, has the FAA experienced um, problems um, installing test center solutions out in the field? Ms. Garvey may want to comment on it also. But I in, guess I would direct it to the inspector. In some instances, and, and you'll note in um, our statement that we, we make a point that the, as a cautionary note that testing in the laboratory can sometimes be different when you go into okay. the real world. And one reason for that, particularly in the FAA situation, is throughout the system they have made local adaptations to their software systems. And for that reason, occasionally when you install something that looks fine in the laboratory in the field, it bumps up against the, this local adaptation change. Um, I think this particular factor is one that contributes to the great challenge remaining over the next three months. Mm -hmm. Mr. Williamson, you want to I would concur with the Inspector General's comments, and that's not, not to say that the technical center testing has necessarily been deficient, but uh, it's to be expected that once you go with live operational testing that you will uh, come up with some issues that weren't uh, fully identified or considered uh, in the laboratory. Congresswoman, I think that's uh, absolutely correct and I th that's why the Denver test, which really is a live site, is going to be so important and we've again very carefully laid it out step by step and it's going to be very carefully monitored. Obviously it's two in the morning so uh, traffic will be uh, will be less but uh, we we expect that that will be very useful very similar to what Wall Street did a couple of weeks ago and in, in testing some of their systems so we we think this is going to be a critical and important test mm -hmm. and and we are looking forward to it did you say April was when you were going out to April Colorado 10th. yes yeah to be there yeah uh, well I think uh, I think we all agree that this is a uh, uh, is an area that's fraught with with challenges and, and problems let me um, um, let me ask you, oh, first of all, would you be doing any other testing after Denver? That's the one that's scheduled right now, and I think a lot will depend on what we, what we learn from that test. Uh, we don't have any other uh, similar tests like that. We have lots of tests planned at the tech center, but for a live test, that's, that's it for right now. You may, you may, want, may, to, may want to do that. Oh, yes, and of course, each center, as it's implemented, will be tested, as the deputy secretary reminds me. Mm -hmm. But... Mm -hmm. I also note um, that a report I think is going to be forthcoming. I want to ask you about it of the what the six most popular sites in terms of an assessment or appraisal of them, like Canada, Bahamas, or whatever. Six would would country, you comment yeah. on that? Yeah, there are six countries where about 60% of our uh, of the Americans travel. travel. And we are mm -hmm. working very, very closely with each one of those, knowing that that is such a high percentage. We're working very closely with those. Uh, in fact, either the secretary, the deputy secretary, or I've met with them at some point during the last uh, year. And uh, in each case, we'll be developing a very coordinated work plan um, for dealing with, with some of the issues, the travel issues that we have. Not surprisingly, we're uh, probably a little further along with Mexico, Mexico and Canada. We have a trilateral uh, meeting, as I mentioned, in May, and that will be discussed there. But Joe Morgan, who's part of our, leads our international effort, has worked very closely, uh, went to Mexico and spent a good deal of time working on a plan together with, with them. And as I mentioned earlier, we are doing the testing this month with Canada. We'll follow it up with Mexico and the other countries as well. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, that was the first critical issue that we looked at. We said, where is it? Uh, as everyone has suggested, the international presents some real challenges. So the first thing we said is, are there areas where we really need to focus some effort? So looking at those six countries where so many people travel seem to be very important. It's interesting that 60 percent travel there. We also Secretary had under Dunham. the auspices of the Council uh, a meeting a few weeks ago with Canada and Mexico on all of the systems, uh, power, travel systems, railroads, police, anything in which there is exchange across the border. And I think we have a very good working relationship with those two countries. What have you learned so far? And, um, some, some interesting things. Mexico, for example, um, has done, I think, a much more um, careful measure of how they're assessing their progress. They have a weighted average that really gives credit to how much work has been done leading up to the completion of a system. So they really know at any given time, I think better than we do, where they are on the whole, on the whole process. And of course, there are you know there are always surprises that, that pop up. And there's useful inter information exchanged about, well, what are you hearing? What are the rumors in your country? And it turns out to be similar to the rumors in our country. But these kinds of discussions, country to country and industry to industry, are very helpful. We had one the other day for all industries that lead to getting coal to the power plants. Because the power plants are clearly mm. critical, but they won't work if coal doesn't get there. So we had the mining industry, the barge, and the railroad industry all in one room at one time. The biggest issue for the mines was elevators. And in fact, they're now comfortable that their elevators are going to work for the same reason that elevators will be working in buildings. Mm -hmm. Any, any uh, kind of dangerous uh, um, issues that came up in so no, far? Nothing that uh, so you think that's light bulb went off and said we better take critical action. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Let me just uh, ask uh, Mr. Downey, I've forgotten what year you joined the Department of Transportation as Deputy Secretary. Most recently as Deputy Secretary in uh, 1993, although I was in the Department in the yeah. 70s. Well, you'll remember that in 93, 94, you had that operation, I forgot, was it in Germantown or somewhere out? They were working uh, on a new radar the, system. Uh, Maybe you don't want to remember I'd it, but... I try to forget it, that. It started uh, before you, so yes. you don't have to worry about it. We, we shut that one you down. You shut it down. It was, uh, a, it was a good example of bad management. Yes, and uh, I knew that as I walked in the right. room. Yeah, Four the billion dollars right. was dumped. Yeah. IRS did the same thing. Now, well, all I'm asking about is not to rehash that dog, but to uh, what is, is that host a successor to that, or are you underway on some other type of successor? The host is a, is a piece of that, and it's an interesting piece. Once we made the decision that a single contract with a single contractor for unlimited funds and unlimited time was not the way to proceed. Working with the FAA, and, and largely these were FAA decisions, we broke the system down into a number of pieces. The uh, display system radar at the major uh, on route centers, which is now moving well. Uh, the system at the uh, uh, terminals, which is in reasonable shape, although has some problems. And then the host, which is the, the heart of the uh, computer capacity at the centers. At the time, 92, 93, it was thought that the host could be put at the far end of this process, as we did each piece. But when we came to look at Y2K issues, and similar to the question you raised earlier, the manufacturer was unable to certify this equipment, we said, whoa, it is time to accelerate that as part of the modernization process but also as a backstop for Y2K. Having it as a separate module, as opposed to part of this overall process, allowed us to break out a separate contract, move that ahead. It is going very well. Uh, in fact, was it Friday? Th or Thursday. Thursday, Thursday yes. the, uh, the administrator and the secretary were up in New York to dedicate the first host, and several of them are now in business and operating regularly as part of the air traffic control system. All of them should be in place by the end of the year. If they are not, there are backup strategies to be sure that they will be Y2K compliant. But breaking that massive project into a series of manageable pieces was the right thing to do, and it's working for us here as it is in the modernization effort. So HOST is 2,000 compliant? HOST will be 2,000 compliant, and in about 
how, how many centers is it now functioning? Oh, in 10. Uh, in 10 centers, it is working today. It's in a Y2K compliant mode. And it would have to work in how many centers between now and January? 10 more have to be uh, installed. So it's a total of 20. Total yeah. of 20. What is, what is this project costing, just for curiosity? In total, I'd have to get the number for you, Mr. Chairman, but it's certainly far less than the number you talked about Less earlier. than four billion. Much, much well, more. you were right to pull the plug at it. This is long before Ms. Garvey came to bring order out of chaos. $172 so, million. Dollars. How much? $172 million. Yeah, 172 million is the host 10. Yes, sir. How about the next 10? No, that's 172 million for the whole job. For the whole job. Yeah, and uh, I think it's, it's, in, it's good to note that the last time we testified before this su subcommittee, yeah. uh, you, you'll recall that we're running out of spare parts. <laughs> and if they don't, for some reason, get all 20 in this year, they'll have enough cannibalized um, hosts to uh, generate spare parts. They'll no longer have to use post-its on the windows of the control tower? Okay, that, that's reassuring to me, because I'm carrying my own post-its in case they <laughs> need it in L.A. Would you like to have any thoughts at the end, uh, unless oh. you have some more questions? I'll just ask another question, and then I'm going to ask them if there's anything they would like us to know um, as we conclude this particular hearing and before we get the final report. Actually, I guess um, GAO, um, to begin with, FAA identified 26 air traffic systems as posing the greatest risk to the national airspace system um, that may not be um, operational through the year 2000. And these systems are going to be among the looked at earlier. I yeah, moved up it, on the timetable. In an ideal world, okay. yes. Uh, but th these are the probably the most complex yeah. of all the undertakings, and because the late start that had a cascading effect throughout the throughout the schedule. So yeah, in an ideal world, I wish it was, had already been done. I'm sure everybody does. Do you have a gnawing concern about it? Uh, no, I think FAA has a, a, a sensible plan. I know it's really crunch, it's, it's real crunched. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have a lot of confidence in the organization. They set their mind to it. I think they can get it done. Well, I think FAA, I think, has, has been working very diligently. And as I have mentioned before, and you mentioned in your opening statement, Ms. Garvey, working around the clock. It's just such a tremendous system and so connected in so many ways. Secretary Downey also on another transportation issue. How about Metro? I mean, what, it, what are you doing to sort of coordinate uh, um, what's happening to make sure that the public transit, transit systems are going to be compliant? We have uh, worked with the public transit systems around the country. Uh, we had a conference in Houston uh, just a few weeks ago to compare notes and to share information. We have also asked under federal transit authorities general authority to uh, regulate the funding that flows to these entities. Uh, to get that funding, they have to be technically proficient, and we have set Y2K compliance or comparable safety levels as part of that proficiency. We've asked the boards of each public transit agency in the country to certify to us by the end of June that they are compliant or tell us what their alternate plans are. So we look forward to hearing from Metro on that. I know that they uh, work closely on this issue. I've talked with Dick White about it. I know they are having some trouble as we speak with their computer systems, but that shows that they are very much focused on making that system work and work safely. Mm -hmm. Ms. Barella, I'd like to uh, just submit for the record, if it would be permissible, um, the letter from uh, Administrator Litton of the Federal Transit Administration asking for all transit um, properties to certify their compliance. Um, before the year 2000, and the reason for that is because that's a comparable to recommendation we're making to FAA. Without objection, that'll be put in the record at this point. Are you finding that they are having difficult? I mean, transit systems, not just Metro, and then I'm going to specifically uh, ask you about what, met what our Metro here in Washington is doing in terms of its compliance. But in general, are these public transit systems encountering problems with funding? Because they get some of it from states and localities, and 
Having been in the public transit business most of my life, uh, I would say public transit systems always are having problems with funding. Um, but in this case, most of them have put the Y2K compliance issue at the top of their list. We helped in that respect by giving clear guidance that any and all federal funds that they receive may be used for this purpose, uh, simplifying the process to get planning approvals, and also giving approval for simplified procurement where it was needed uh, to uh, use the funds effectively. So we don't think that that should be a problem. Uh, we think getting focused on it, uh, working through the issue of how their um, rail equipment or bus equipment may differ from anybody else's rail and bus equipment is what they have to do. But uh, the large transit agencies around the country, I think, are working very hard at this. They're all in town this week. Both uh, the administrator and I will be speaking with them this Excellent. afternoon, and this will be on my uh, uh, list in terms of uh, what we expect them to be you doing. You tell them that Congress feels the same way, too, that, uh, right, and the Washington, the, I mean, the nation's capital uh, system is, should be a leader. Are they a leader? They, they are a leader in working on this. They are doing it. Well, I just want to, um, uh, I want to thank you from my point of view for answering so honestly, not only answering our questions and being here, but the work that you've done preparatory to that and how all along you've worked so very well with Congress. We wish you well. And Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask uh, unanimous consent that uh, Mr. Barsha, the ranking member of the Technology Subcommittee, that his statement and statement of any other members of our two subcommittees be included in the record. Without objection, they will be put after Mr. Turner at the beginning of the hearing record. I want to uh, thank all of the four witnesses. You've been very helpful to us. Uh, first, I want to thank, before I close this, uh, the staff that put this hearing together. Uh, J. Russell George, the staff director, chief counsel in the corner down there of the Subcommittee on Government Management. Uh, Matt Ryan, the senior policy director, specifically responsible for this hearing right behind me. Bonnie Heald, professional staff member, director of communications, immensely helpful. Mason Allinger, our clerk, who has been very helpful. And for Ms. Morella's subcommittee on technology of house science, Jeff Grove, the staff director on technology. We thank him and Joe Sullivan, the clerk, and Ben Wu, the professional staff member. And our friends on the other side of the aisle, uh, Faith Weiss, the counsel, and Jean Gosa, the uh, clerk, and Mike Queer, the professional staff member, and Marty Ralston, the clerk, uh, have worked and done a very helpful job. And we thank our court reporters, as usual, uh, Doreen Dotzler and Lori Harris. Uh, it takes a lot of people to prepare the hearing and permit us to have questions that are so interesting to you. But let me now uh, thank uh, those that are here and say that I think this testimony of yours has been very compelling, and it's shown the transportation and the Federal Avi Aviation Administration will continue to be industrious and vigilant in order to solve this problem. And we appreciate that burst of energy that will be needed to get around the course and win the game. The Department of Transportation and the FAA provide vital services to our country, our citizens, and our economy depend on the safe and expedient transportation of both personal and business travel, goods and services. And I'm concerned we have a lot of work to do. I've got a lot of faith in the people before us that it will be done and that you will need the continued collaboration of departmental officials, the airline industry, the airports themselves, to ensure that the system is ready by January 1st, 2000. I appreciate the Secretary and the Administrator's reinvigorated leadership to solve some of these technology cha challenges, and I think a lot of work still remains to satisfy all of us, and we'll know, won't we, on January 1st when you're flying and I'm flying. Just don't bump into my plane as you go across America. And uh, I've told you before, be very nice to the controllers for the week before we board those planes. And uh, our oversight activities will continue on this agency as well as all others. Later in the week, we're going to hear from the Federal Aviation 
administration's uh, other hat and our other hat, the financial management practices, which have nothing to do with Y2K, except where's the money, as somebody said, and can you put a balance sheet out? So we, Mr. Wilmington will be back and we'll be back. So I thank you all for your helpfulness on this and we wish you well in the months ahead. And with that, the hearing is adjourned. Next, White House Press Secretary Joe Lockhart's daily briefing. That's followed by Energy Secretary Bill Richardson and members of the Senate Armed Services and Intelligence Committees on alleged nuclear technology transfers to China.